it's really important to reframe that mindset of, I can talk to people about what I'm going through. It's not going to be too much. I just need to find the right people at the right time. Welcome to This Way Up. We are bringing you engaging, informative, and inspiring conversations surrounding all aspects of mental health from the perspective of us as parents and caregivers. I'm Andrea Nanigian. And I'm Emmy Waters. When someone you care about is struggling with their mental health, this can be an incredibly stressful and challenging time. So we're here to provide valuable resources to support you as you navigate this journey. Emmy, I am just blown away by the maturity and the insight of a 2021-year-old 20, today speaking about her life experiences, her roles as a caregiver, and as a self-advocate. Just unbelievable. Yeah. So our guest today is a young woman in Denver finishing her undergraduate degree, an amazing artist, but also, Andrea, our teacher. Yes. She simplified things that made me, that, that I so often complicate. Mm-hmm. Same. I don't know if it's a generational thing, but there certainly were so many moments in this conversation where I just felt like, my gosh, here I am, 50-something, getting great resources and tidbits from a 20-something-year-old. It's mind-blowing. It is. Well, let's meet Ella. Ella Serholtz is a student at the University of Colorado at Denver. She will be graduating this May with a degree in illustration, and she is an incredibly talented and skilled artist. She specializes in storyboarding, visual development, writing for animated film and television, in addition to freelance illustration and fine art. And she'll be looking for a job soon, right, Ellis? We got to pump you up there. (laughs) Yes, I am. Ella was a TEDx speaker in 2021. She gave a TED Talk entitled Art of Vulnerability as part of the TEDx Youth at Vail. And we are so excited to have you, Ella. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to talk about it more. And I'm also very flattered that that you liked that <laughs> talk. I mean, I'm curious, how how did you guys find it? I think I found it because just from knowing you through friends of friends and seeing your artwork, I think in looking at your artwork, it popped up like in a Google search. Oh, like on Google? Yeah. yeah. Cause I, yeah, I, I like to Google myself <laughs> so often um, as you do. And that's always one of the first things that pops up. So that makes sense. Can you talk a little bit about how you got there? I don't know if you called it just a general speaking event, but there was a TED talk event in Vail, Eagle County. Um, in 2021. It's an entirely student organized event um, and they do it every year. And so I had had friends who had done pieces for it before, but I had been able to help out with set design for something for one of the years prior. Yeah, they just open up applications every year for people to sign up. And I, I did speech and debate, which is like an after school club thing where it's like a bunch of different speaking events and you go and compete. You know, not to not to toot my own horn, but I got state champion a couple of times in my event that I did Woo-hoo! a couple of times. <laughs> I say once, but um, even being like, I just tend to be kind of a very shy, anxious person. But that was just something I happened to do and really enjoy. And so it kind of fit into that category. And yeah, I just figured like I would apply on a whim because I had things to talk about. And at the time, um, it was my senior year of high school, and I was doing an AP art studio class or an AP art portfolio, whatever it was, alongside it. And we had to pick a concentration to do a bunch of pieces for it. And so what I had chosen was, yeah, pieces centric around my mom and kind of what she was going through and what our family was going through at the time. And it just coincided well with the topic that I wanted to discuss. And I think it fit in well to the theme that year. And so yeah, I just kind of applied on a whim and I heard back from them that I had been accepted. That's incredible. Well, you're a teenager at that time, a teenager in high school, speaking about the art of vulnerability. How did that come about? How did you land on that topic and that specific focus? 
yeah, at, at the time I was also figuring out like college applications. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? You probably don't come from a long line of speakers and thought leaders on vulnerability. The subject of vulnerability coming from a teenager. Where does that come from in you? And what does that mean to you? I think necessity of survival is really what I would break it down to because I, I am a firm believer in if you don't access those feelings, they're going to get you eventually. It also, I think it really comes down to, I think it's a very generational thing on how we respond to, like how we respond to and process trauma and like how we feel about accessing mental health resources and therapy and even acknowledging that we have those issues. And it's fantastic to see that, especially now, like a lot more people, especially my age group, are really, really encouraging talking about mental health and going to therapy. And, you know, there's less stigma around these different issues and there's less stigma around medication and getting help and just talking about these things. Um, but I don't think that is especially true for a lot of age groups above ours. Because I don't know, it's, I think that therapy and just talking and being vulnerable in general is a very taboo thing. And like, I, I have, we have a history of a lot of different mental health things in my family. You know, half of my family is very Midwestern. We don't talk about it sort of thing. Um, just kind of keep it all under wraps. And that's what it was for a lot of my growing up. It was very much, we need to hide this. We need to make sure that like, no one sees this. This isn't an issue. I can't let anyone know that this is a problem going on because it's just too scary to face. Yeah, I mean, now it's like at this point, it's it's just become necessary for my ongoing existence as a person. Like I, I need to be able to acknowledge these things if I'm going to lead a life where I'm happy and healthy and functional. And so I've been able to I've been doing therapy with a therapist that I really like for a bunch of years now. And I've finally gotten access to medication. And I finally like talked with my younger sister now. And I'm seeing her kind of go through that same journey of going to therapy and figuring out all her stuff. Even as a lot of our issues are ongoing, it's not hidden anymore. Real quickly. So you said that you came from a family that for early in your years, kept things under wraps. You went out and did a public speaking event on vulnerability and talking about these issues. How did you have the courage to do that? I mean, that's just so impressive to me because I mean, you, were you just said you were raised not to do that. Thank you. I mean, I don't know. As soon as I was thinking about it and, and kind of deciding on it, I got support from them to do it. I mean, I think it was one of those things where it wasn't super intentional. They didn't want me to hide things on purpose. That's just kind of, you know, what you learn from observation. But sure, I, I had that support from them when I decided to do that. And also, I think that approaching that idea through art first really helped. Because mm. that's just that's a way that makes a lot of sense to me to communicate and and express myself through. Ah, that's a good point with the art. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you think the art helps you tap, like originally helped you tap into some feelings that you didn't even realize that you, you had? Oh, I mean, I'm not an artist, absolutely. so I don't, I don't know any of that, but that's, wow. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think a lot of it started out as escapism and then it kind of turned into a form of processing, which helped with this. And now Sometimes I, I kind of struggle to access that the same way because I'm not living in those same circumstances. Sure. So it doesn't come up as easily or it's a little, I find it's a little more difficult for me right now, for whatever reason, to be super vulnerable in that way or like access super deep themes through art, but it still holds the same amount of importance. Yeah. It could be like, the, it's such great therapy for certain people. Oh, definitely. Can I ask a a non-artist question. This is going to really be an art, a non-artist question. So <laughs> <laughs> when you're doing art and you're accessing those deep feelings, are you like, I picture myself like sobbing over <laughs> because that's how I process things. Are you feeling, are you laughing or crying? Or, I mean, just, it, are you feeling those intense feelings as you're doing the art or are you just, is that how you're getting those feelings out? 
That's such a good question. I know. I I want to get to the point where I am like feeling so deeply and outwardly expressing it when I'm making stuff. That's something that I'm still working on is is still like accessing those super raw emotions. Cause I just I have a tendency to not present those things outwardly. I think that's most of us. Yeah. Yeah. And especially now that I'm at a point where I'm kind of more comfortable talking about it and I've been able to process a lot of it. It's really things I don't know. I, I find myself like really overwhelmed with those emotions in certain like circumstantial moments or like I'll have I'll have certain like memory triggers of things from like CPTSD related stuff. So mm-hmm. that's that's when it gets like super emotional. But yeah, it's it's kind of hard to say. I haven't really gotten to a point where I've been overwhelmed when I've been making stuff. That's just sort of my way of getting it out. And it's either the before or the after that's kind of that intense emotional moment. It's such a gift to have that vehicle to process anything because a lot of us, like Andrea and I, will we'll process verbally maybe with each other or however we're doing it independent of each other. We don't have that ability to channel emotions like you do right. in an art form. So I think that's, that's such a great question, Andrea. But yeah, you do kind of, you wonder. But I guess the other thing that really sticks out is lucky for you that you have that <laughs> that know. way to to channel channel the emotions oh i am so incredibly grateful that that's something that i had and that was supported and encouraged and that i've been able to continue to do i don't know though i'm i'm a firm believer in the idea that that's for anybody like art therapy is for anybody drawing is for anybody there's no standard of what it has to be I don't think it's ever had to look a certain one way or depict any one thing. It's just kind of like the the act itself is so therapeutic that it could take any shape and it's just it's for anybody. I don't I don't think there's any sort of gatekeeping of what art is, you know. So we don't have to be able to draw like you is what you're saying. To have some benefit. <laughs> My stick figures <laughs> <Yeah>. will <laughs> suffice. I'm not sure if I can express raw emotion with my stick figures, though. I don't know. <laughs> I, I like a stick figure. I, I still I still like my stick figures. I mean, I find that when I am doing something emotional, it it's not really that refined. It's more scribbly and imperfect, and it's just more to get the idea out instead of, like, the actual final product. And I, I often find that I let go or I just like ignore a lot of the the schooling yeah (laughs) that I've been or just whatever like the rules are for something to look good and I just get more scribbly and quick and it looks more I don't know it it maybe looks more crude but it's more it makes I don't know it's better for more authentic for you saying yeah Mm -hmm. it's more real time I'm not so focused on the aesthetics of it Yeah. I wonder if that's like, because we were talking to somebody, you remember, Andrew, about being in the body, even she talked a little bit about somatic therapy. And I I think it must be along those lines, right? Just getting, feeling an emotion and more of an in-your-body experience through the act of drawing or even scribbling rather than just like swirling thoughts in our head and being stuck in emotion. So maybe that's part of the key to it. I think too. So my mother-in-law, she was one course away from getting her doctorate in child psychology. Then she had my husband and a bunch of kids. One course away? Kids. One course away. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Anyways, she, <laughs> and then she dedicated her life to, you know, other things. But so my son, when he was three or four, was like having nightmares and grappling with all of this stuff. And I'm like, what in the world is going on with a three or four-year-old? And so she said, well, have him draw some pictures. And so I gave him a whiteboard marker and he drew on our big like living room window and he's drawing these pictures, like these blobs in the sky. And then like with things coming down. Now, my husband is a huge history fanatic, Mm -hmm. loves World War II. Apparently those big blobs in the sky with the things coming down were airplanes shooting bombs or dropping bombs down. And so he was having nightmares over this over this thing. And so I think art is from a very fundamental level when we're, as we're developing as kids, a way to communicate as well. Absolutely. And not have to use words. Yeah. Good point. 
Absolutely. No, I think, yeah, art therapy or just like art of any drawing of any kind is especially important for kids. Because, I mean, that's how, you know, that's how we communicate before we have words. We communicate in touch and in pictures and kind of like a way to depict those arbitrary concepts that we don't have the capability to describe yet. And that's a great way to teach kids to embrace that vulnerability and learn how to mm-hmm. describe their emotions right off the get go. I mean, you don't you don't need to be able to talk. You don't need to have the language to describe how you're feeling mm-hmm. yet. Like I I only just learned the language to describe my feelings like a year or two ago. <laughs> I mean, it's it's taking me up until this point and I know that comes like even later for a lot of people. So, with that sort of vulnerability. Yeah. You made a good point. And I think those insights do come later for many if not most people. And so that's why Andrew and I think it's so special to meet you and have this conversation because you're young and have yeah. the wisdom of somebody much older. And we'll give people the links to that TED Talk so they can hear it for themselves. But um, Andrew and I were just talking about you being a young person as you relayed in that TED Talk. You are a young person and a caregiver and realize the need for vulnerability, as you say, but also the need to lean into a support group and be open and ask for help. We thought that that was pretty amazing that you came to those conclusions when you were just a teenager. Can you describe how that came about for you, those realizations? Yeah. I mean, I think at the time I was saying that more than I was feeling it, like knowing that's the right thing to do, but not but like having such a difficult time putting that into practice myself. And I mean, I, I still even struggle to do that sometimes because I never know like what's too much to share, what's enough, like, you know, like how much of this am I supposed to put on to other people? How much do I need to process myself? It's all, there's still like a lot of unanswered questions and things that I'm working through. And I I believe that that's going to be a lifelong process, but I think a lot of that realization came from, too, like how crucial the support was from our friends and family in order to just have been able to live a somewhat normal life for that period of time. Like our uh, one of our family friends and our neighbors, and it was Bill. He would drive us into school every single day. A lot of the time, he was the reason that we had food. And that we like he has a daughter that's my sister's age. That was a friend out there, you know, and I mean, like he even was someone that I was able to talk to because he would he would have conversations with me like I was not like I was a full adult, you know, because I'm in fourth Mm -hmm. grade. You can't you know, you can't talk to a fourth grader like they're a full adult. But he he treated me like I wasn't a little kid and I was able to have those conversations with him. He was the reason that my mom was able to get to the hospital in time because she had like this t- like really, really late stage liver failure. Oh gosh. And me and my sister, like at that point that had just become normal. We weren't able to recognize those signs. Also because you have someone who's going through this and telling you like, no, it's fine. There's no problem. And you're just like, oh, okay, this is normal. Mom says so. Yeah, he was a friend to her through all that because she struggles really with like, that connection too. So yeah, that's like family friend support. Um. I mean, lots of other people from around the valley, my aunt, my grandparents, they would fly out from Michigan just to take care of me and my sister, like overnight, just so we had an adult around to take care of us because my dad had to go to work. So he wasn't able to be there. So uh, yeah, I mean, I just getting to the point of realization, like, oh, all of these people chipped in to make sure that me and my sister were getting this basic support that we needed yeah. and just able to so we were able to eat every day so we're, we were able to have an adult that was looking after us and even if they weren't able to do that 100 percent of the time it was enough to where we were okay in that sense and I mean if we had just been so completely isolated for that entire time I mean like who's to say uh where we would be now Well, you really had validation that it was okay, that you didn't have to carry the world on your shoulders. You know, we always say when when kids are younger and everything, you know, like they fall down, you're like, get up, 
you know, and you're trying to teach them to be independent. But the reverse of that is we also need to teach them to be dependent with things when things get tough. So you had kind of that natural, unfortunately, that natural opportunity to learn that at a young age, that it's okay that you don't need to just walk around with the burden all the time. It's very important to get help from other people and people are want to give that help. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I think it took a while for that to stick because that, that was more in reflection that I figured that out. And I think at the time, I just spent most of that growing up period thinking like, oh, I have to take care of all this stuff. Like me and my sister, who is three and a half years younger than me. So she even got a lot of that from a younger age than I am. And I mean, she's like one of the most mature, like amazing, thoughtful people that I know. Um, I think the world of her, but we kind of, we almost had different, like different roles in being caretakers. Like I would, I would do a lot of the clean the house for the most part, do food, stuff like that. And she was kind of more of an emotional caretaker for my mom. And they had a connection in that way, mostly for, for worse. But yeah, we, we almost would fulfill those two different roles and self-contain that almost because we wouldn't even talk to each other about it. But once it kind of got to the point where she was fine, like my mom finally was in these programs and we had a second to kind of see, like just breathe for a sec and reflect and kind of see her in a completely different state than what she was doing before and just be like, oh, yeah, it's it's really important to tell people what's going on even if a lot of the time we're being told we don't need to or being encouraged not to a lot of that is like without exaggeration Mm -hmm. life-saving and there were there were lots of moments in reflection where I should have told somebody what was going on or I should have called somebody else to help figure it out and I didn't but I I can't really blame myself for that because that's just what I knew how to do so I I'm just I'm grateful that we got around to that eventually and I figured that out eventually and had kind of a safe environment to think about that in you know what I mean Mm -hmm. but I'm sure like I'm sure it's just a constant journey of figuring out how to rely on other people as you go throughout your life one thing you mentioned was Bill yeah like you you called him out specifically and I think Remember, um, Emmy, and I can't remember which episode it was, but there was the gentleman who said that children who grow up to show resiliency had one very instrumental adult in your, mm. in their life. You remember that? Mm-hmm. Now, you've had many, but you pointed out Bill. And if I'm Bill, I'm giving myself a big old, you know, pat on the back <laughs> or whatever. But I think it's important for people to hear, adults to hear how important we are what the difference we can make in a child's life mm-hmm. long term. I mean, this is yeah. years after this, by just listening and by treating them, you know, with compassion like we do and, and hearing them out, even if we're not related to them, even if we're not parenting them. Yeah. Especially with young people, they're out, they're always watching, taking it all in. You never know what's sticking. Mm-hmm. No, he, he was also one of the only adults that really like would talk to my mom and also saw firsthand what was going on. And when we would talk, you know, he never tried to pretend that he knew what was best for me or that he was like the number one role model in my life. But I mean, that was really important because I just got to have like, even if they weren't related to stuff that was going on at home, I got to have like a lot of really honest conversations with him about just various things and like his life and the things that he's done. So yeah, definitely very, very instrumental person in my growing up. And I'm, I'm really grateful that he was there and really showed up for us, even though he never had to, you know, he chose to a lot of the time and very grateful for it because I think a lot of that has stuck with who I am now. Mm -hmm. I bet. Yeah. It's great that you have that very keen sense of awareness and that gratitude because that's beautiful. And you just take that and you plant it and becomes more and more and more in your life. I love it. Absolutely. The gratitude is very important. Yeah. <laughs> I've found that's 
Like, I, I know that that's what a lot of people say. And you're like, oh, how does just being grateful, like, improve my life at all? I mean, that feels like such a small thing, but it really does. It keeps you looking for the positives. It keeps you finding the good things, even if there's only, like, one or two right then. There are always things to appreciate, and it kind of keeps you out of the... It gives you something to latch on to, even when you're, you know, everything feels like it's crashing down. You know, curating these valuable conversations is really about our shared passion for promoting mental wellness. Behind the scenes, however, there are several platforms and systems that help us bring these episodes to you. If you found value in our conversations and feel inspired to support, please consider making a donation. Whether it's the price of coffee or wine or more, your contribution directly supports our ability to keep connecting, sharing, and growing with you. Please visit our website at thiswayuppodcast.com to support this community. We thank you and we appreciate you. What does a gratitude practice look like for you? How does that awareness, um, how do you use that? Or, you know, yeah, I don't even know how to word it, but how does that work for you? Like, how are you remembering that? And what is the cadence of that? How does that pop up in life? I think it keeps me from being super anxious <laughs> all the time. I mean, if I, it's not even always super on purpose either. Like there, there's not any time I sing to myself where I'm going to like, I'm going to block this out or I'm going to journal it or anything like that. I, I can just kind of sit and just take a deep breath for a second and look around mm-hmm. me and go, you know what? Yeah. I'm, I'm allowed to feel good for five minutes. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm allowed to appreciate where I am and look around and find like a thing or two that I really like about my surroundings. Like, Oh, I'm going to watch this squirrel over here. He's doing something weird. That makes me happy. You know, just like anything that's, even if it's super, super small, (sighs) just find, just taking a deep breath and finding like anything, even if it's not just like being intentional for a moment, doesn't have to be like a whole big thing, but just for a second, like it's so very, very grounding super important keeps me from crumbling (laughs) into pieces a lot of the time yeah that's huge you said you're um a very anxious person I would imagine having all of those responsibilities from when you were a kid probably and not really knowing how to manage that has uh you know probably that's probably why right um but you don't seem anxious You seem, you know, we get you on the, um, we see you on the TED Talk and you're so well-spoken and you're just, you know, very mature and everything. What kind of things are you doing to help relieve that anxiety so that you can go out and just be the the bubbly girl that you are? Thank you. Um, Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I think a lot of it is just internal and I've gradually become accustomed to not letting that have such a chokehold on me but definitely I mean like a lot of that a lot of that social energy just kind of comes from being nervous and like when you mentioned the TED talk too public speaking makes me more nervous than anything and like my face gets all red and I feel like I'm gonna like start coughing because my mouth gets so dry and I'm so nervous and actually like for that talk specifically it had been a year since we were going to do it so I hadn't looked at it at all I hadn't practiced it at all. I hadn't done anything. So I memorized it right before I went up on stage and did it. And it's like, I, I remember, I you can barely notice it now because I went back and I looked for it. There's like a second where I pause. That felt like 10 minutes. I was oh. all of a sudden I froze. I was like, oh my God, what do I do? Um, but yeah, I think it's just come from learning how to play it off a little bit better and just kind of hoping for the best. And forcing myself not to think about how that comes off. I think self-awareness is important, but when it gets to the point where it's controlling your every thought, it's okay to dial it back a little bit. You know, just trying to think, not think too hard about how other people are perceiving that because at the end of the day, it is what it is and that doesn't matter so much. Yeah, just like thinking about the the other person's perception because a lot of that anxiety is social and kind of how that works with other people. And again, like the vulnerability or just like how my relationships with other people look, that perception there, 
or even if I just get myself into these thought spirals about everything bad that's going on, you know, that's what either like a combination of shutting off my brain for a little bit and also just looking for good things helps me to just kind of move, move forward in a way that's more practical. If that makes any sense, I kind of feel like I just rambled there for a second, but that makes sense. Well, it sounds like you have a lot, a lot of different ways. <laughs> yeah. And you really, at like, I don't know, Andrew, what you think. I think it sounds like you're using a really healthy lens, a healthy perspective, because you do point yourself towards light and positivity and gratitude. And pretty much everything you've been talking about has been in some way a positive reflection of a lot of challenge and struggle in your past, which is very beautiful. And you've clearly just, I don't know how I'll say you have like a yes and kind of mentality, right? You're not hinging back on, oh, these bad things happened, or this is my past trauma, or this is my difficult childhood. You never say those things. You're just saying, yes, and, and I had Bill and he taught me this and I'm grateful. I have this, I have art. This is my process. And it's just so completely heartwarming, I guess. Refreshing. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) And I think that's what creates resilience. Yeah. That's why you're able to get through all of this because you do, you just are like, okay, this is her perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Your perspective back to perspective, Emmy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a word that comes up almost every single conversation. I know. It's all we need. All we need is that perspective as the tool. The perspective is very important for sure. Yeah. Ellen, what is it like in your peer group, people your age, your friends? And how do conversations of mental health pop up or do they in, in younger people today? Yeah. I mean, for the most part, it just comes up very casually. People are just very casually open with their things that they're going through, even without going into too much detail where it maybe gets a little more personal. It just is something that's there and it's not really an elephant in the room and people just talk very openly or like jokingly or casually about it. And that's just a very standard subject. But then if I get into those more serious conversations with my friends, like we all are able to rely on each other in a way that doesn't feel too overwhelming because all of us are, you know, like in therapy or getting help in some way or another or processing. And so it's it's not like we are maybe I, I hesitate to use the word burdening because I know a lot of people can feel like when they're sharing their struggles with other people, they can tend to feel like a burden when they're not. Yeah. But also it's important to acknowledge that when you're talking about your struggles it can take an emotional toll on the other person and you need to make sure that they're in a place where they're able to receive that and hear it. And so with with everyone being so open about their mental health and what help they're getting and the resources that they have, everyone's in a place to receive those talks and we're able to just be honest with each other and support each other, um, give advice if the other person wants it or just be there to listen and kind of update each other on on where we're at. And so I think there's, I would say there's little to no stigma around people's mental health struggles. And I mean, that's, I think it's very different for a lot of people. I think that's probably because I'm in a place where I'm around a lot of other people who think the same way I do about that. I know that there are still so many people who are my age that are struggling with that and are in like very different stages of, of where they're at with that. So it's not really a one size fits all thing, but I would say that generally for my age group, it's a very non-stigmatized thing. That's interesting. You said such an important thing, which was when you are sharing things that you need to be able to recognize that the other person is able at that point to receive that I think that's such an important thing to teach somebody or to to follow up on with your own kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think I've ever really had that conversation because it just comes so naturally to me. But I know my husband has said something like, read the room. Well, that's not very, well, well read the room. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I mean, you get it, but it's a, it's not it's, it's not as soft. But is is that person able to receive this at this moment? It's huge. That's huge. Yeah. How would you know that? Right. I mean, really like ask is what I've found is just ask like, hey, are you 
are you, can I like tell you something or can I like ask for advice on something? And it's totally fine to say no, you know, it's, it's completely okay to be like, Hey, I don't really know if I can take that in right now. I don't know if I can deal with that. And that's not a fault on anyone's part, you know? And I think it's so important that we learn how to approach that in a way where a no is not seen as a complete rejection. Cause I think a lot yeah. of people may get discouraged by the possibility of a no and be like, Oh, I can't talk to anybody because it shouldn't be anyone else's problem, but mine, it's too big of a burden to bear for any of these other people. And like, to a degree, it might have been because we were in middle school and high school, and I couldn't rely on any one other child to right. listen to my issues and do something about them. But that's why there are professionals who... I mean, that's why like therapy resources are getting more and more accessible. They're not always great because I know like really good therapy can be very expensive, but they're, it's getting, there's a lot more available now. It's, it's really important to reframe that mindset of, I can talk to people about what I'm going through. It's not going to be too much. I just need to find the right people at the right time. And you can't really expect someone and it's hard, but that's that's really important because I think that fear keeps a lot of people from being open with anybody at all. And that yeah. shouldn't be the case. Just because like your your friend isn't able to help you with this situation doesn't mean that nobody is able to help you with that situation. Yeah, good point. That idea, I'm so glad you explained it the way you did because so many different things popped up when you when you were talking, but the idea of not wanting to be a burden, just that in and of itself, to me, is very closely aligned with, I don't want to be vulnerable. So that, I mean, because I, I'm just, of course, looking at it from my perspective, what I've done in the past, I might say, oh, I don't want to bother you. But really what I'm saying is, I don't want to share. I don't want to be vulnerable. So your response of, when Andrew and I are like, well, how, how do you know if somebody can receive what you're about to give them? You say, ask. Okay, if I ask, if I go to Andrea, right? The next time I have a nuclear meltdown and Andrew's on the other line, if I were to ask, I've already taken out that part where I'm afraid to be vulnerable because I've already put it out there. So you also alleviate the burdening aspect. But those are so similar to me. The burden, not wanting to be a burden and just not wanting to share, right? Oh, definitely. And I mean, I think a, a lot of that comes from the overthinking of it, too. And that's what the explicit ask removes is there's there's not the room to overthink. You don't you're not sitting there anticipating what the other person's thoughts and an actual response is. It's you're just you're asking, you know, that's a complete but that's very open. You know, you're not like, oh, I'm overthinking. What are they going to say? What aren't they going to say? How do they actually feel? What am I doing to them? And you literally do that. You would literally ask. You do that. You practice that. Oh, yeah, 100%. You brought up two good points. And I think I've learned something very important today. One is that you have to ask for it, you know, the asking piece of it. But then two, the other person has the responsibility and the ability to say no. Mm -hmm. And I think by imprinting that in my mind that the other person has control over whether or not they want to hear my questions or feelings at that moment. And that if they don't, they'll say no. That would calm my mind enough to know that I can then ask and not fear that they're sitting back there, you know, judging what I'm saying or saying, oh my gosh, you know, I really want to go to Target in five minutes. Why do you keep on talking to me? Because the responsibility <laughs> is back on them. Andrew, would you ever say no if I asked if I can? No. Yeah, I was going to say, you wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same token, at the same token, I would never say no, but I would also, I just would be there. You know, I, that's the type of person that I am. Mm -hmm. um, I would just be there. Although I do need, yeah, well, okay, Emmy, you bring up a good point because there are several people that my daughters had to intervene and be like, okay, yeah, no, this is my mom. She does not need to, you know your therapist for that. No. So, <laughs> but no, I would never tell you, no, Emmy, you can always, you can always call. Right. It's, it's hard when you're someone who likes to say yes. Cause I'm, I'm also one of those people. I'm, I'm also always like, yeah, I'm super open to talk. I'm always here for you. Tell me anything that you need all the time. And it, 
could get like I could very easily let it get to a point where it's detrimental to me. And so it's it's really hard to get over that fear of saying no. But I mean, the thing that I think helps me is that no isn't permanent. It's just for that moment in time. And I could take some time to prepare myself or just to kind of evaluate like where I'm at and how supportive I can be. Or even if it's like a limited amount of supportive, I can be at the time and not just like super limitless. So it's, it's hard to navigate that, but I think it, it makes it more open and honest when you have that very explicit understanding between those two people, you know? I would agree. Yeah. I've got kind of a personal question and you can just tell me to bug off if you want to. So I would imagine when you were young and you were a caregiver and you were being asked to do things, you did them because you didn't know how to say no, or probably didn't even know that you could say no. And you've alluded to the fact that now things are are tough again. Have you been able to grow into those boundaries and be able to put, you have, that's fantastic. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, part of it is being physically separated from it. And I have been able to somewhat establish those boundaries with my mom that if she's in a state, I can't, she can't just like reach out to me with a lot of things that I I just can't hear or I can't talk to her about. And, you know, it's uh, those boundaries didn't exist at all when I was growing up. I mean, it's, I figured I couldn't say no because when I tried, it just wasn't received like I I didn't really have the option because of backlash I just kind of had to do what I needed to do and as such like my sense of boundaries just completely non-existent in my mind the things that I did really only existed to help other people and to serve other people and be like completely selfless to the point where I didn't really consider my own needs at all Mm -hmm. and now it's gotten to a point where I, I can advocate for those needs. And even if it's in a sort of way where it's not maybe being heard in the way that I would like to communicate, I'm still able to take a step back. I'm not afraid of that backlash. I know that I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Establishing boundaries can be very tricky. How did you learn to do that? Or did you have help to gain that perspective? How did that work? Yeah. Therapy definitely helped me um, with figuring out how to navigate that and what to say and just even like having the confidence to do that because really to establish boundaries, a big part of what it relies on is the other person accepting those and, and standing by those. And it's really difficult to say like, hey, I am not in a position where this is okay with me and the other person could just completely choose to not listen to that and just keep going. And so I've kind of needed to learn how to just separate myself. And like, for me, that looks like turning off my phone. It's just, that's a pretty easy way to approach it is just, I can just turn off my phone, but just finding like your own space, going somewhere where you can like isolate yourself and just say like, Hey, I have these boundaries, you know, if and it's it's really hard. It's it's so tricky because it's not a one size fits all. I'm in a position where taking a step back works for me, but you know, like I it didn't it didn't used to be. That wasn't an option for me. It really is so dependent on the situation. Yeah. Well now knowing that you have learned so much about establishing and maintaining boundaries, it makes perfect sense the statement she made earlier, Andrea, about being asked to, if I'm ready and in a place that I want to receive that. Right. That's her demonstrating her boundaries that are even beyond me. Like, right? So mature. Mm -hmm. Very mature. Unbelievable. You know, the world gets scared of your generation because you're using text to communicate. They're like, how are they going to socially navigate? But the more and more I talk with young people your age, the more and more I am impressed with your ability to tap into yourself and to advocate for yourself and then communicate that out in an articulate, non-abrasive way that facilitates a conversation. I'm just, I'm in awe. I'm in awe. So well said, Andrea. Yeah. 
Thank you. You're welcome. It makes sense to me. It kind of seems like a pattern where the the generations above the other ones will look down on them for various reasons. And I know that's a cycle. Like even now, I, I look at ten year olds and I'm like, ooh, <laughs> ooh, you have a lot of issues. You know, like oh, but I, yeah, I mean, I, of course, tons of problems <laughs> as as there is, but also I'm very proud of my age group for really mobilizing their resources and using things like social media and online communication as a tool to be loud about stuff that they care about and to reach out to all kinds of people. Because I mean, the reach that you have on the internet is infinite, especially compared to, you know, communication before that was so widespread. You have your immediate circles, but now you have like an infinite reach to anybody you could ever possibly think of. And every day I see people like using their platforms to talk about things that to share factual information, to organize rallies, to, you know, create things like like podcasts and online discussions and videos and amazing TED Talks. Just really right. Just <laughs> Just really taking advantage of those tools. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Again, another very mature, helpful perspective. Absolutely. You have been our teacher today. (laughs) Ella, this took a direction that I wasn't anticipating, but I am so grateful for. Yeah. Really, really grateful for. Absolutely. You're very well spoken. Thank you. (laughs) And you're going to do great things. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) As somebody who's a speaking of you, has been a former teenager more recently than myself. What advice would you give to, let's say, a teenage individual listening to you right now who does struggle with asking for help, who struggles with that honest communication and vulnerability? How would you coach them? It's never going to feel perfect. You're you're never going to feel like you're doing it 100% right. It Especially at first, it'll always feel awkward. There's no perfect way to go about doing that. It's it's always going to feel a little bit uncomfortable because you're really bearing all of your wounds. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. And that's a really scary thing to do because that's where judgment hurts the worst. That's where, you know, like you you don't always know what the other person is going to say. It's you know, it's just, it's, it's hard. It's really difficult, but that's kind of how it's supposed to be. Mm, thank you for that. Ella, thank you so much. It was a joy speaking with you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me on. It's, I don't get the chance to talk about this stuff a lot because it doesn't come up super often, but I think it's, it's important for people to, to hear, you know, it's very important for people to hear even 50 some year old people to hear. Thank you for tuning in to today's conversation. To join our community and access more valuable resources, please visit our website at thiswayuppodcast.com. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and share this with a friend. And to stay connected, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Listen to This Way Up. Listen to This Way Up.